Hello. I'm delighted to be able to speak to you today at the International Conference of Urban Language Studies. Thank you for having me. My, my name is Ingrid Piller and I'm a professor of applied linguistics at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. My work has long been concerned with questions of intercultural communication, multilingualism, language learning, linguistic diversity and social justice. I am interested in language barriers and bridges, how language repertoires affect um, social participation and limit or enhance access to social goods such as education, employment, health care, and all aspects of social life. One such intersection, and the one I'm going to talk about here today, relates to knowledge production. Is there a relationship between a scholar's linguistic repertoire in their access to fair and equitable participation in the academic circuits of knowledge production. Let's start by looking at some at, at who produces knowledge in our field. The table that you see here is from the Schimago Journal and Country Rankings. That's an academic ranking website that is widely used in making determinations about academic performance. The slides show you performance rankings by country in our field, so that's linguistics and language. The rankings are based on the number of publications in the field published in reputable recognized outlets. As you can see, the US leads the rankings by a wide margin. In the past 20 years, 105 and 424 publications or academic documents in linguistics and language have been published in recognized journals by academics based in the US. So that's the repository of knowledge in our field, if you will. Second on the list is Great Britain. And um, so that means scholars based in the UK also produced a lot of knowledge in our field. As most of you are probably based in China and I am based in Australia, let's look at rank number seven and rank number eight. Um, our countries are very close, so um, that's great. Um, we are in the top 10 of linguistic knowledge producers in the field. But once you stop to consider our relative populations, 1.4 billion in China versus um, 25 million in Australia, things start to look a little less rosy. Are Australians five to six times more active knowledge producers in linguistics because we invest more in language? Or do we have some other advantage when it comes to linguistic research? Well, I guess we all know the answer to that question. The massive advantage that Australia enjoys in comparison to China, given our relative populations, and of course also relative, and this is also true for the US, for the UK, Canada, is the English language. What is considered knowledge in our field? And this is true of most areas of academic knowledge, so this is not only about linguistics, is created through the medium of English. That the English language offers a huge advantage when it comes to participation in global academia is well known, of course. The countries of the Anglosphere exert a virtual monopoly on knowledge dissemination and evaluation. English linguistic dominance in academia goes hand in hand with epistemic dominance. That means that knowledge produced through the medium of English is privileged over knowledge produced in other languages. As we all know, academic knowledge production is driven by publications and particularly publications in the most central circuit of academic knowledge production. So those um, highly ranked journals that are published in Q1 journals or Q2 maybe, and that are highly ranked in rankings precisely like the one that we are looking at here. When scholars from outside the Anglosphere need to work much harder 
to actually be included in those highly ranked publications, they experience epistemic exclusion. That means their language background or location outside the Anglosphere constitutes an unwarranted infringement on their ability to contribute to knowledge production. Linguists from outside the Anglosphere may be working extra hard to get their research published in the most valued academic journals. And we see that Chinese scholars are clearly doing that. They are being ranked seventh in the world. The same is true for scholars in Germany, Spain, France, and so on and so forth. But this raises another question. Are their voices actually equally heard? And do they have an equal chance to achieve impact? To find the answer to that, my colleagues um, Jenny Shang from Shongnan University of Economics and Law in Wuhan and um, Li Jia from Yunnan University in Kunming, um, and you've already heard from them during this conference, together we identified who the thought leaders in our field are and where they are based. We define thought leaders as the 100 most cited scholars in applied linguistics and in sociolinguistics, as per their Google Scholar profile. As the diagram that you see on the slide reveals, 110 of them, and that's 55%, are affiliated with a US or a UK institution. This is obviously a massive overrepresentation. A further 31, that's 15.5%, um, are affiliated with an institution in another Anglophone country, such as Australia. So um, together, that's 141 out of, two, out of the 200 most leading scholars in our field. So a staggering 70.5% are based in the Anglosphere. A further 36 or 18% are based at a university in continental Europe and only 23. So that's really only 11.5% um, of the most cited scholars in applied linguistics and sociolinguistics are based in um, the rest of the world, if we want to call it that. And um, I have to say, not a single applied linguist or sociolinguist based at a Chinese university is among the most highly cited scholars. Although China, of course, accounts for 18.5% um, of the global population, constitutes the second largest economy on the planet and invests massively in research. And although scholars based in China are the seventh largest producers of linguistic knowledge, as we saw on the previous slide. So although that is the case, they're not really being cited. What that means is that the chances of scholars in the Anglosphere and in Europe, not only to get published, but also to make an impact and to shape the research agenda of the field is massively inflated. By contrast, the opportunities of scholars from outside the Anglosphere, and um, we could add continental Europe maybe, so from the rest of the world, as unfortunate as that term is, um, is massively, massively underrepresented. So what I've just outlined here is the problem of linguistic and epistemic exclusion in our field. Now, probably what I've just said to you is not really new to you. Um, and the question really is now, what do we do about that? Do we just roll over, play dead and accept these exclusions? Or is there a way actually to move forward in a positive way, um, combat exclusion and achieve a measure of um, impact in our field? My colleagues and I believe that there is, and this is the story I'm going to tell you. The story of linguistic and epistemic inclusion that we want to tell here is based on an extended body of sociolinguistic work related to the language and communication challenges raised by the COVID-19 pandemic. 
This work can be found um, at the citations on the slide, so on the Language on the Move COVID-19 archives and in a special issue published by Multilingua devoted to linguistic diversity in a time of crisis. I'm not actually going to talk about the content of these publications because I know that you've already heard about that from um, Dr. Li Jia during her presentation at this conference. I just want to say, and um, I do this with all due humility, that the China-centric knowledge that we collected in um, the Language on the Move COVID archives and in the Multilingual Special Issue has actually had a disproportionate impact on the field. The lead article in the Special Issue, for instance, has already been cited 125 times, which is actually phenomenal given the exclusions I just spoke about and also just the mere fact that um, this is a linguistics publication that is less than two years old. So that's really good and suggests strong impact. Um, so as I said, I'm not going to dwell on the content, but I want to share the success story, right? How, how did this come about and what is the story behind this um, inclusive publication? I will address three research questions. Um, I will speak about academic and personal networks in which this published product is embedded. I will speak about the textual scaffolds that lie behind the published product. And I will speak to our role as linguistic and epistemic brokers. I do so by drawing on um, a collaborative autoethnographic case study that we also published in Multilingua. You see the citation here, and there is a short version published on Language on the Move. The citation is also on the slide. Both of them are open access too, so um, just follow the link or Google the titles and um, you can read it all in detail. Autoethnography is an increasingly popular qualitative method where the researcher draws on their own experiences to investigate a social phenomenon. In a collaborative autoethnography, researchers pool their lived experiences and um, collaboratively analyze and interpret them for commonalities and differences. And collaborative autoethnographies are really becoming very popular for um, marginalized scholars to systematically explore their experiences of isolations, but it's also a methodology that, that not only investigates what is, but also contributes to overcoming exclusions and isolation and achieving some sort of inclusion. The participants in this particular collaborative ethnography um, were myself as the editor of Multilingua and Language on the Move and my collaborator, collaborators, um, Jenny Shang and Li Jia, as I've already mentioned. The three of us are an established team and we have been collaborating for um, over two decades now. Jenny and I first met in a teacher-student relationship in 2001 and um, she's since gone on to not only do her PhD but also become an associate professor at her university. And um, both of us met Li Jia during an intercultural communication conference in Wuhan in 2012. And that's the photo you see on the slide here. Um, together with actually another two former PhD students, PhD graduates in our network. And the Wuhan connection actually proved crucial for the special issue as I, I'll explain um, a bit later. Let me now move on to our publication platforms. Multilingua is an international top 100 linguistics journal. It's a Scopus Q1 journal in two fields, namely in communications and in linguistics. The journal is published by the Germany-based publishing house De Greuter Mouton, 
It was founded in 1982, primarily to focus on questions of multilingual terminology in Europe, but it has since grown and extended its focus and established itself as a leading journal in multilingualism and intercultural communication from a sociolinguistic perspective. I myself have served as the editor since um, 2013 and Jenny is a member of the editorial board. The other um, publication platform we are talking about here is Language on the Move. That's, um, you see our home screen on the on the slide here. This is a virtual research dissemination platform, which I also edit. Um, it was founded in 2009 by myself and my then postdoc, Dr. Kimia Takahashi. And it connects scholars with interests in intercultural communication, language learning, bilingual education, and brings their research to a broad global audience. The site currently hosts um, 900, about 900 research blog posts and content pages and um, over 8,100 reader comments. So it's a very lively, engaged, interactive platform. We publish one new article about once a week. Um, and please do come and visit, it's all open access. The 144 contributors to Language on the Move are based in 28 different countries, and it's a very international crowd. Our readers come from all over the world, and our top 10 audiences currently are from the United States, China, Australia, United Kingdom, Philippines, India, Germany, Canada, Japan, and Spain. With this background, let me now move on to the findings of our collaborative autoethnographic case study. As I said, we posed three research questions. I've just put them up on the slide here again to um, remind you. Let me start with the first question, the one that relates to academic and personal networks. Our special issue, as I said, was um, conceived and produced in the early phase of the COVID-19 pandemic between March and September 2020. And for that to happen, to produce something so promptly, we were the first um, special issue in the field, in the English speaking world to actually come out. and. Um, and we did so obviously during a tough time for anyone in the world. Um, to achieve that, two academic networks were crucial to the timeliness with which we were able to produce the special issue. First, there is language on the move. And second, there is the Chinese um, School of Language and Social Life by um, Professor Li Yu Ming. And um, I'll just focus on the first one here. If you want to read more about the seconds, please go to that article that I mentioned to you earlier. So our ability to spring into action and produce the first concerted global research effort related to the language challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic was undergirded by our longstanding personal connections. As I've just said, our previous student teacher relationship has formed our shared vision, our shared research interests, and um, the network is of course not limited to the three of us, com but comprises a much larger global network, as I've just said. And most of the key members, and you can see some of them here on the, on the slide, are um, a very diverse crowd, mostly very smart and engaged and strong women who I'm very, very proud of to be part of. And um, so most of them are former PhD students of myself. And the three of us all credit um, this network, uh, the, which we call the Language on the Move Network, with nurturing our academic and personal growth in different ways. For several peripheral multilingual scholars in our network, starting with publishing, starting with research blogging on language on the move, offered a first step to finding their academic voice. 
um, as Gegentel Bayud, for instance, says in the quote that I've got here on the slide, for me, research blogging, editorial help and comments generally of generously offered by the team indeed cleared the first hindrance when I embarked on sometimes intimidating publishing journey. What makes language on the move significant and unique is its embracing of diverse writers and hence and hence its production and spread of local knowledges. That's where I found my voice in the first place. So because we had that network um, in February 2020, that kind of proved pivotal to share perspectives on the COVID-19 pandemic. Our special issue in multilingua developed out of a number of reflective research blog posts that we could, you know, like in real time publish on language on the move and where team members, particularly in China, shared their experience of what was then only an epidemic in China. And um, so to sum up this part of my presentation or to sum up about our networks, to contribute successfully to global knowledge production at a moment of global crisis, it was crucial for us to be centrally included in at least two different networks, and um, there are others, um, namely this English medium network that I've just mostly spoken about. And um, from there, let me now move on to my second and third research question related to textual scaffolding and epistemic and linguistic brokerage. As I've explained, before we ever thought of the special issue, a series of research blog posts devoted to the language challenges of the pandemic was started on language on the move. The response to some of those early blog posts inspired us to consider proposing a special issue. Viewer numbers and social media metrics allow us to gauge whether a post has struck a nerve almost in real time. For instance, um, Li Jia's post of, of March 4th in 2020 about the exclusion of linguistic minorities in China from crisis communication proved immensely popular. It was viewed um, over 2,000, over, excuse me, over 20,000 times within um, a few weeks, which for an academic publication is just really quite amazing. And so we felt it was our duty to contribute to facilitating a better understanding of and a more effective response to the language challenges of the pandemic. And we believe that a special issue of a prestigious international academic journal would give this effort greater weight and inspire more scholars to join the research effort. In the early stages, the timely and interactive process also helped to build solidarity with the authors in lockdown in China. And um, over time, contributors coalesced into a global community of practice devoted to researching the language challenges of the pandemic in their different geographic and sociolinguistic and sociopolitical contexts. So um, research blogging that formed the basis of this emerging applied and sociolinguistic inquiry by also showcasing efforts of junior scholars and scholars in different places around the world. From there, let me move on to um, epistemic brokerage as another central aspect of the process behind any successful publication that you usually don't see. Um, I've got here the, um, an image that kind of gives you the metaphor of um, success as an iceberg illusion. People just see the success, the final product of the special issue in this particular case, but they rarely see what's underneath. And um, publishing, academic publishing is a bit of a black box anyways, and often... Um, Junior scholars or scholars who are struggling with their exclusion just find it really difficult to understand what goes on behind the scenes. And so we, we want to be as open as possible about what went about the process that went into it. And so I've already spoken about um, 
the networks. I've spoken about the textual scaffolding. And now let me move on to the kind of brokerage role that myself, but also Jenny and Lija played. Um, there was an incredible amount of work that went into that. And um, I'm going to focus particularly on translation work and editorial work. To begin with translation, um, one way to challenge the dominance of English is actually to produce knowledge in more than one language and kind of create synergies between the knowledge we produce for a global audience through English and our local audience for which we produce knowledge in other languages. It's kind of not necessarily always a translation or a, a word by word translation, a strict translation, but may also address slightly different audiences. But essentially, you know, bring all our languages to bear on the communication of our research findings. Um, we around the special issue and around the COVID-19 archives, we created a wide range of um, other texts that were intended to disseminate knowledge about that text. And um, there were also social media promotion campaigns. And we undertook those in parallel. And um, mostly that was done in English and Chinese, but also in um, Arabic, German, Italian, Korean, Mongolian, Persian, and maybe other languages that we don't even know about. Um, and the rationale for translation, for interpreting, and for the production of parallel texts is clear. It constitutes the surest road to reaching diverse audiences, and so also for international knowledge transfer. transfer. And so it's a key means of linguistic inclusion. Now, let me move on to editorial work. The special issue obviously involved a lot of normal editorial work, such as developing a proposal, soliciting contributions, selecting abstracts, communicating around 200 rejections. We got so much interest and um, we wish we could have published you know, all the research ideas that were presented to us. So um, that was a really tough task. And then um, once we have made our selection, liaising with the authors um, of those abstracts that we had accepted, undertaking editorial reviews, managing the peer review process, liaising with authors through their revisions, and um, communicating with the publisher and doing all that in record time. I mean, all of you know, how slow the mills of academia work. And so getting done from an idea in March 2020 to getting the publication out into the world in September for an academic publication is really like lightning speed. Um, now, my dual role as editor of Multilingua and also as co-editor of the special issue meant that some of these tasks were a bit less onerous. So like, you know, we didn't need to find a journal and take the proposal to that journal and negotiate with the publisher. Essentially, um, you know, I, I, my liaison role facilitated some of that. But this relatively small labor saving was far offset by um, editorial work that is not considered normal editorial work. And that is specific to working with a um, group of scholars that are outside the central circuits of knowledge production and um, that work into English as an additional language and um, to do so at a time of crisis. According to my work log, I spent um, around 200 hours between March and September 2020 on editorial work associated with a special issue. And um, our rationale for this really heavy time and labor investment, which of course you can only do a couple of times in your career, was motivated by our commitment to fighting against um, the linguistic and epistemic exclusions 
that I started out with in this presentation. Now, let me conclude. To conclude, um, I'd like to speak a bit about the implications of our collaborative autoethnographic case study. Confronting linguistic and epistemic exclusion, as we have done here, requires not only an understanding of the processes behind academic production or behind global knowledge productions, as I've outlined here, but it also requires transformative action. And that's what we've also tried to do here. And um, transformative action rests on at least two recognitions. The first recognition relates to the insularity and myopia of a dominant vision that is solely focused on the central circuit of knowledge production. Many of our academic um, institutions kind of suggest to us that rankings and publishing in key journals, Q1 journals, highly ranked journals is all that matters. That is actually not true or is another means to actually prolong and extend the epistemic exclusions that we then criticize. Knowledge flows in many directions and in many circuits, such as the circuits um, like the Language on the Move network that I've outlined here to you. Engaging with um, multidirectionality, with multiscolarity requires the kinds of networks and teamwork that take a long time to build. And um, as, I, as, as I've spoken about. The second recognition relates to the affective dimensions, the emotional dimensions of knowledge production and the importance of ethical relationships of care. These are vital for transformations. Um, as, as another editor um, has reflected on the emotional labor of editing, and I'm, I'm quoting here, journal work goes beyond shaping the intellectual contours of a field and it involves building and maintaining a community. For us, the community building around language on the move is the foundation on which the central academic publication discussed here was built. And it is built on a network of um, affection and care and friendship and just really also enjoying working with one another. Working towards overcoming linguistic and epistemic exclusion in academic knowledge production involves building and engaging with various networks, collaborating across borders, across generations, creating publication opportunities and volunteering our time and expertise to act as linguistic and epistemic brokers, because all of us have something to contribute and to mentor um, the next generation, more junior people and so on and so forth. And this all goes back to um, the reminder that Toni Morrison, the, um, really reminds us about um, once we have achieved some status in academia, once we have achieved a job that we have been so brilliantly trained for, it is our real job. If you're free, you need to set someone else free. If you have some power, the, your job is to empower someone else. And I hope that my presentation here has been inspiring to you in the sense that, um, yes, there is a lot of linguistic and epistemic exclusion in our field, but there are also ways to overcoming them and to engaging in transformative action. And that's what we must do. Thank you so much for your attention.